Welcome to Beulah, and thank you for joining us today with Pastor Brian and Beulah's worship team. Hey friends, Pastor Brian, Beulah Church, and thanking you for joining in with us and sharing this broadcast with your friends who are still at some type of quarantine or stay-at-home process. We are grateful for the opportunity to be able to step into your home, into your car, uh, with you on the side of the ball field, that you could be encouraged spiritually by the work that God's doing through us here at Beulah. Many of you also are beginning to visit with us and be on campus with us, which we have a Saturday evening from 6 to 7, a Sunday and three Sunday mornings at 8, 9, 30, and 11. We want to remind you of just a few things that at, on Sunday, all of our services have a children's ministry worship session. And that is from K through 5th grade. So we want to encourage you to jump online at BeulahChurch.com, sign your child up with all of the respective paperwork and uh, so that they can be here and be prepped for that. We also want to let you know that this is a Sunday uh, that we will be ordaining our new deacons and we will be praying over them in all four services as well as this Sunday um, is the, we will announce, many of you know last week, that we had our vote for the remodel of the sanctuary project. And we are giving God glory that that uh, vote passed with 89% approval. So we will be getting the ball rolling to looking at the day after Christmas to begin our sanctuary remodel project. Now, again, we're grateful for all the things that God is doing. Our student ministry is meeting on Friday nights from 6 to 8. Many, many other opportunities are uh, ahead of us as we look at our small groups and um, our Sunday school being able to reconvene uh, before the end of the year. And so we'll have more information. So we want to encourage you now, text a friend, say, hey, join with us. If you watch this broadcast and would share it with them, we'd love for you to do that. Many of you have asked, how can we give and be a part of the ministry uh, at Beulah? You can go on our website, BeulahChurch.com. Or you can text to give and sow into the ministry that God is doing here with and through us. And so we are excited. So let's prepare our hearts for worship. Let's gather together in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for your goodness and your power. We thank you, Lord, that we can assemble and we have the, the opportunity and the platform to worship together. God, would you bless all that we do, from that which we sing to how we worship you through giving and engaging in your word. God, would you speak to us today in a way that would uh, help alleviate burdens in our heart, clarify the truth of the gospel, and dear Father, remind us exactly of what our mission in life is, and that's to bring you glory. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for our church uh, growing together and their uh, in the vote for the remodel. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, in advance for how pressed down, shaken together, running over, that, Lord, we'll be able to pay for this with cash, and we're giving you glory and praise for that. God, we celebrate you for today that we get to ordain deacons, and, Father, that our children and our student ministry, Lord, is thriving. We give you the glory for all those, and all that's ahead of us, dear Father, for our, our our Frontline Hero Fest, October 25th. God, would you bless it and help us to continue to grow in our presence on campus, dear Heavenly Father, and online. Help us to reach more and more people with the truth of the gospel. And Lord, be pleased to keep your hand mighty upon us. Now, for those listening today, God, I pray that you do a revolutionary work in their life. I pray, God, that you pull them out of either sin or mediocrity and win them to yourself and we give you the glory and the praise for that. And we trust you for even greater things. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. Come on, guys. Let's stand up, even in your homes. Let's turn up the radio in your cars. Let's lift a high praise to God. See you in just a bit.
This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my heard the phrase finish what you start this is a powerful phrase because it is true god is the great finisher of everything he starts listen in as pastor brian encourages us to honor god by finishing what we start hey guys let's pray this together father in the name of jesus would you speak to my heart that i could grow in you that you would birth faith in my heart and my mind that I would trust you above all else and follow you regardless. I trust you now that you would speak to me, that I may obey you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever heard someone say the phrase, finish what you start? Finish what you start. You know, follow through is important. It's uh, vital for every activity in life. It's vital for sports, whether you're swinging a bat, whether you're uh, taking a shot in and, uh, on a, on a, uh, on, while you're wrestling, uh, while you're playing football, a defensive line, follow through with the route. It's important in project management. If you're responsible for pulling things off and, and getting things done, follow through is absolutely key. It's important in investing. You can't just uh, fear the market that's ahead of you. You have to stay in and ride the waves occasionally to get the long-term benefit. It's important in vocation. Whatever you do, you've got to follow through. And that follow through is to show up early and sometimes stay late. And to do that day after day, month after month, and year after year to have the level of living that you want or the opportunity for even more. And it's important in relationships relationships thrive on follow through that if you start something you got to finish it and wherever there's a fracture in it it sends uh, it sends just sky, uh, just schisms and fractions in hearts and minds that sometimes people never ever get over you need to finish what you start and that's not just true in the above listed characteristics or or, or uh, activities the bible knows that to be true this is our last sermon in the series, Church, the Ancient Future Community. And in this last series, friends, I want us to see that God wants us to understand that finishing what you start or what he starts in you is vital. God wants us to see that the thriving church, which is made up of thriving people, but people not thriving on their own strength, but because Jesus is in them, is to be led and filled by contributors, not just consumers. There's always people willing to stand by and watch everybody else do the work, but that's not what makes a true, powerful gospel ministry. Every saved person has a responsibility to grow, know, show, and go. Think about that. We do. And if you're yet not saved, then today is the day of salvation for you so that you can grow in Christ. You can know more about the will of God so that you can show the reason why Christ died on the cross and you can go wherever he wants you to go. 
it's not just about how you start. It really is about how we finish. Vance Havner said it like this, God has a place and a purpose for you. Some, something that he has called you to, and you will never be happy elsewhere or doing anything else until you are right where God wants you to be doing what God wants you to do. Now, we're going to work our way now through the entire end of the book. Colossians chapter 4, uh, we're going to look at a list of names. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, and I'm going to tell one on us. Uh, the majority of us, when we get to a list of names, we absolutely just flip through them as though they are people in a remote, distant land that have nothing to do with us. But you see, the people that we read about in the scriptures, well, they're probably a you and a me and a different time frame, but we're struggling with some of the same things, going through some of the, things, the same things that we're going through now. So I want to encourage us as we read through this, not to overlook these names as you read the Bible, but to begin to consider who are they, why does the Bible mention them, why are they included, and what can I learn from them in reference to this. You see, this list of names really can be divided in a couple parts. The categories of those who journeyed to the church at Colossae from where Paul was, uh, those who send their greetings to the church because they stayed with Paul, and those to whom Paul sent a greeting uh, through the church at Colossae that this work was supposed to keep going on. Now, I want us to see these individuals. I want us to celebrate them and see what we can learn about them. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 4, verse 7 and following. Notice what the Bible says. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with another brother, Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you, who will tell you everything that has happened here. Tychicus. Paul writes out for us that he is uh, he's going to tell him of all the activities. He's going to he says that he's a beloved brother, that he is a faithful minister, that he is a fellow servant. And he says he sends him to, to, to the church at Colossae so that he may encourage their hearts. Who is Tychicus? Number one, he's a native uh, uh, to Asia Minor. And he became a Christian under Paul's ministry that you can go back to and see in Acts chapter 20, verse 4. He's also listed in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 21 and 23. Listen to the word of God. He says that he's a dear brother, a faithful minister in the Lord, and will tell you everything so that you will also may know how I'm doing and what I'm doing. And I'm sending him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that you may incur be encouraged. What do we know about this? You say, well, Pastor Brian, that's just a report. I mean, uh, are you looking too much into this? No. You see, many times we do uh, what we call signaling. In other words, we uh, basically your behavior sometimes dictates really who you are. And the list that we're going to see, Paul lists out a lot of people's behaviors that really identifies who they are. Tychicus is a guy that really lives missionally. In other words, his life is on mission for the gospel. Uh, this means that wherever he is, ministry is bound to happen. Wherever Tychicus is, there are going to be gospel moments where the gospel just breaks in and transitions a, 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 side, a, a side of the road conversation, a, a standing in line to, to get something to eat. Just, hey, come over here and meet a friend of ours. This is Tychicus. And before you know it, the friend gets saved. And, and, and everywhere Tychicus is, a gospel moment happens. He has a servant heart. And it's not just Sundays for him. It's every day. He is the expression of not Jesus and me, but Jesus in me. He is a person who can be trusted with the details. Have you ever noticed sometimes there are people that embellish the truth? Tychicus isn't one of those. Paul says, I'm sending him to you so that you'll know exactly how I'm doing. Now, remember, Paul's in prison. And so Tychicus is coming back to say, hey, here's what Paul needs. Here's what he's going through. Here's what's ahead of him. Here's what you can expect as he awaits trial in Rome where, where it's ultimately is going to happen his execution. And Tychicus is trusted with all of these. 
The other thing is that Tychicus, he says, comes to you so that he can encourage your heart. That means that Tychicus is not a negative Ned. He is not someone who is just ram, 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 ram. He has a way of telling the details that inspire hope, that inspire trust, and that build an excitement, a real courage that people can hide in called encouragement. He is a powerful vessel for the gospel. He's accompanied with a guy named Onesimus. And if you've ever read your Bible, you're probably familiar with Onesimus. Onesimus, the Bible says, our faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. And he also will tell you everything that is going on and taking place here. But remember, Onesimus is the runaway slave of Philemon. If you've never read the book, now I know most of you look at it and think it says Philemon. It is Philemon. Philemon was, uh, was a gospel worker. He owned a bond servant named Onesimus. And Onesimus flees him, runs into Paul, gets saved, and now he is a real full-fledged convert. He isn't just hiding out. He isn't just running to the to the to the the people of the way, the disciples, to say, protect me from the big bad Philemon. He is a guy who has totally surrendered himself to the Lord. He's willing to stay with Paul, but Paul's sending him back to Philemon as well to say, hey, don't you just take him in as a slave. Take him in as your fellow brother in the Lord, as a Christian, as though you would take me in. And, and Paul would say in Philemon, if Onesimus owes you anything, then put it on my account, which Paul flips it on and says, Philemon, you wouldn't be where you are today if it weren't for me and God using me in your life. So you owe me your life, Philemon, so take Onesimus back in. Onesimus is a fugitive that's turned Christian. And as a real convert, now he's honest, he's loyal, and he's transformed, and he's dedicated to the mission. Sometimes people, instead of really becoming converted, they just get a little weird. Not the case with Onesimus. This guy just didn't change in habits. His entire life has changed, and Paul's able to use him in the gospel. Now Paul's going to talk about three guys. Three guys who are not like just any guys. These are three guys that are Jews, that have, are proving to be a great comfort to him. Listen to the word, Colossians chapter 4, verse 10 and following. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a great comfort to me. Now, what's going on? Aristarchus is a guy that Paul says is a fellow prisoner. In other words, He's not just hanging out at the place where Paul is. He too has been indicted like Paul for sharing the gospel. Now, he possibly could have gotten saved in jail or been a part of their ministry and fell under the same indictment. In the ancient world, Christianity is still not popular. It doesn't become popular in a, in a legal state religion until Constantine in the 300s. And so at this point, anybody who shares the gospel and there's any kind of consequence, either a culture turns upside down, um, financial brackets change and shift because people stop buying and participating in pagan things, you as an individual could be really sought after and pursued. Number one, by the Jews who are saying you are leaving the truth of what you've always known as a kid and they could ostracize you. Or in the government, they could not only take all your property, uh, indict in your entire family, they too could um, arrest you, flog you, and execute you. That's difficult for us to understand from an American point of view, but we may not be very far from that kind of lifestyle. That's why we must treasure Christ. It's not Christ and me, it's Christ in me. But he is an encouragement to Paul. He blesses Paul, and he sends his greetings. He says, Mark is also with me. Now, you may remember Mark. Mark is the guy who is the cousin of Barnabas who creates the first riff in the first missionary journey, and everybody knows about it. Thus, that's the reason why Paul writes and says, you've received instructions about Mark that if he comes to you, please welcome him. You see, uh, there are those in the Bible that start willingly, they think they can make it, but because the, ste the hill is so steep, somehow or another, they've just not grown in faith to keep up. And so they can't persevere. 
but over time they can grow. To the point that Paul, while Paul was red hot mad at Barnabas, so mad that it caused a split. Paul and Barnabas committed themselves to the grace of God, but they split in their missionary journeys and efforts largely because of Mark. But Mark grows and to the point that Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.12 and says, get Mark for he's proven very, very useful to me. Now, here's what's so powerful about Mark's life. And you may know this, Mark didn't start out strong. He was strong out of the gate, but he didn't make it. He gave up pretty pretty easily. But he becomes useful. Not only useful, but he becomes a personal aid to Peter. He helps promulgate the gospel in Italy and Egypt. He's also traditionally known as the gospel writer of the gospel of Mark. So here's the point. You may start... Uh, your start may not indicate your finish and your finish may not look anything remotely like how you started, but you can in Christ finish very well. And then there's Jesus or known as justice. <laughs> That'd be kind of difficult uh, to, uh, to be called Jesus <laughs> in a religion that is all about Jesus, a faith that is all about Jesus. And so it's better known to be <laughs> called Justice. Hey, Justice, which his name still means Joshua or the Lord saves. So <laughs> you walk around with the name Lord saves, you, uh, you better be a part and partial of your name or your namesake. But here's what's so awesome about these guys. These guys, Paul says, are the only Jews that are involved in the kingdom work. In other words, they let you know that even though there are Jews that are giving themselves to Christ, there's not many who are willing to stick their neck out and say, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah and I want to help other Jews and Greeks uh, grow and know who Christ is. And that's the case a lot of times in the church. There are people that believe that Christ is who he says he is, but they're not willing to serve to the point that it may draw them out of their group to where their group may go. I think you're taking this a little too seriously. Aren't you taking this a little too far? I mean, come on. You think you need to go and do this? You always have to be at church? Are you really going to go overseas? Are you not afraid of getting sick? Blah, 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 blah. All kinds of things. And these are the only three, Paul says, that are willing to serve out of the Jews who know the background that Paul knows, and they're willing to share the fulfillment of who Jesus is. And he says, these guys are a great comfort to me. What an amazing blessing to have home court people, what I call, that not only know what you know, but they have given themselves to Christ, and then they comfort you, they encourage you, they build you up. Thirdly, he's going to mention another guy. Listen to what the scripture has to say. Verse 12, Epaphras who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Heropolis. Epaphras, this guy is the bomb. Wow, he is amazing. He's one of them, so that means he's a Colossian. He's a servant of Christ. He struggles on behalf of them in prayer that they could stand mature, fully knowing the will of God for their life. And not only for them, but the church at Laodicea and the church that, that's at Heropolis. He's a servant. He more than likely heard Paul preaching in Ephesus, gets saved, and immediately becomes an evangelist and takes the message back to Colossae where a church is established because of believers. He fully identifies with carrying the cross. In other words, he is the Lycus, uh, Lycus River Valley evangelist and pastor. He takes the gospel to Colossae, and he is dedicated for them in prayer. Man, prayer for him is warfare. He calls people by name. He prays against specific stuff. He wrestles in prayer. And it's difficult to struggle for people when you use prayer as your nighttime ambient. That's not how uh, Epaphras uses prayer. No, he believes it's a wartime radio, and that's probably the progress and the reason for the progress of the church at Colossae. He prays for them that they may stand mature. Literally, uh, uh, Epaphras is the fulfillment of Colossians 1, 9 through 11, where Paul says, I pray for you that you may know and be filled with the knowledge of the will of God 
and with all spiritual wisdom and understanding that you may be mature, lacking nothing, able to please God in every every good work, bearing fruit in every good work, and live a life that's pleasing to Him. And know that you have been qualified with the saints to share in the inheritance of the one who took you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the Son that He loves. Epaphras is living this guy, living this life. If Tychicus was a missional guy, <laughs> then Epaphras is Tychicus on steroids he gets it he wants it he wants it for these people and he's a hard worker there are many people that are willing to be uh, consumers very few that are willing to be contributors and Epaphras is a contributor you see this he's your prayer warrior here's the guy that you can put in a room and let him pray and watch things happen just like this matter of fact you could put him anywhere and the gospel will go forward. Put this guy anywhere and watch God do amazing things through him. Come on. You got an Epaphras in your life? Woo! That dude is the bomb. Woo! I love it. And so he goes on from Epaphras and he's going to mention two other guys. He's going to talk to them and say, um, he says, I vouch for them. He builds them up. Then he says in verse 14, he says, Oh dear, our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Luke and Demas. Now you remember Luke is the doctor and the historian. Luke is the writer of both uh, uh, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And he writes to a guy or maybe a community known as Theophilus. Theophilus is a Greek name which means lover of God. And so he sends his greetings. Here's a guy who is who is a, a longtime travel companion. He served without any distraction, with no wife or with children. And as tradition has us understand that at 84, he fell asleep in Boeotia, uh, in, in, full of the Holy Spirit. And he's teamed with a guy named Demas. Now, Demas is, uh, is a unique individual. At this time, Demas, a lot like Mark, is very, very strong. He is a companion. I would say that since Luke is traveling with Paul and recording everything that's going on, he Paul puts Demas with Luke so that he could see what it really looks like to serve Christ without distraction. Because later, Paul's going to write to Timothy. One of the reasons why he tells Timothy to get Mark is in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, he says, Demas, he says, do your best to come to me quickly for Demas because... He loved this world or this present age, has deserted me, and has gone to Thessalonica. In other words, there was an uncured passion in Demas' heart that caused him to bail and bail hard. Now, when the Bible includes you in bailing on the mission of Christ, that's pretty serious. That's real serious. And so you got to think that maybe he's the guy that gets choked out and Paul was trying to grow him and, and put him with a loop to say, here is a guy that you need in your life to really show you what it means to serve the Lord dedicated when things are easy, when things are tough, when we got plenty, when we are in, in great need. And, and it's tough when, when you don't have the personal support that you need. And it's tough when, when you're loving people and you're growing people uh, and and you have a, a personal support and a friend that gets sifted by the world. Friends, I want you to know that's one of the toughest things about being a pastor sometimes is that when you have friends who have been great support to you but have something happen in their life and instead of surrendering themselves to Christ, they get sifted by the world. And that's exactly what happens to Demas. At this point in the, in the context, at this point he's strong, but later we'll find out that he's deserted Paul. And that raises the question again, like we talked about Mark. It's not an issue of how you start. It really is an issue of how you finish. And is your life being set up right now to where you're going to finish well? You see, Paul is surrounding himself with people who understand the power of the gospel. He goes on to say, not only with Luke and Demas, but in 15 he says, Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. He says, and after this letter has been read to you, see, see to it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read from their letter. Now, we don't have their letter, but we do have the letter written to the church at Colossae. And what we need to understand at this point is that he's writing, he's saying, hey, also greet them because there's a new work that's going on there. 
and to Nympha. Nympha, her name means bride. Now, whether she was renamed when she became a Christian uh, to e exemplify her walk with the Lord, maybe she came out of, out of a, a really pagan culture. But what we're seeing is, is that Paul is surrounding himself like Jesus with men and women who are faithful, who are real converts, who are convinced of their calling, people who can shoulder the power of going and staying, and people who can serve as a home base for the gospel. And when you think about the people that he's just listed, it makes me want to think of just a few questions that I want to ask you. Number one is what kind of group are you involved in? What does your friend group look like? What is your peer group? Even if you do go to church, what does that group look like? Do you Are you connected with people? Are you slipping in? Or are you sliding out where nobody even knows about your faith? Are you growing toward this kind of discipleship that you are a real convert? You are faithful. You are convinced of your calling. And you are growing and helping grow people who can not only stay if they need to, but they can go if God calls them to. You see, Paul spends time building them up so that when the need is there, there's no question, they either satisfy the need or they go to the need. Uh, this is their uh, sending is their aim. He doesn't have to stress over trying to, to convince them of the need and the vision and the opportunity. Guys, there's a lot of time wasted sometimes as a pastor or many pastors don't ever get to see the opportunity, that the real fulfillment of what their church could be because their people <clears throat> aren't growing as real converts, faithful, being uh, convinced of their calling. And so every time there's a real project, the pastor has to spend all this time convincing people of the need, of the vision, of what we're supposed to do. And they wear themselves out and they're like, nah, I can't lead this church anymore. I need to roll on. And that's a shame. You see, if you know Christ is your personal Savior, your pastor shouldn't have to convince you of what you should already know you should be doing. That's the course of discipleship. That's the reason why Bible study is not an option. That's the reason why prayer is not an option. That's the reason why Bible study and prayer are not just for big-time believers. No, no, it's for every one of us so that as we read God's Word, we meditate on it, we pray it, and we begin to obey it, that when we are led by a strong pastor or in our group, we see that need, poo-yow, we handle it. And it's not a divisive way of handling it at all. It's a way in which keeps the entire body moving forward just as this body did. Their growth in discipleship takes care of this kind of opportunity. And, and Paul wants that too for the Laodiceans. But you'll remember the Laodicean church is much like Mark, much like Demas. They, they're, they're very vital. They started out energetically in the Christian community. But in the end of the century, they suffered from lukewarmness. As Revelation chapter 3 verse 14 through 22 says, God says, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. In other words, the lukewarm water does not refresh. It makes you sick. And he says, I'm going to spew you out. It's stale and it's stagnant. And Paul took time to write to this church um, so that they could grow, presumably at the same time that the Colossae church was growing. And But here's the point. What kind of church are we becoming? Are we ecstatic but set up for lukewarmness? Or are we growing in real discipleship so that it, sending and going, as we said at the very beginning, <laughs> growing, knowing, showing, and going are part and parcel of our walk with Jesus. You see, guys, as a pastor and as a disciple, really as a disciple, I've been a part of volunteering churches, but I've never been a part of a church where everyone takes the responsibility to serve. I've been a part of discipleship churches but I have never been a part of a church where everyone is growing as a disciple. I've been a part of a church that is a, that where, where the, they have shared the gospel. But I've never been a part of a church where every man, woman, boy, and girl was willing and equipped to share the gospel. I've been a part of giving churches. But I've never been a part of a church where everyone was a biblical tither. That means that 10% is the base, my first fruits. And you say, Pastor Brian, why are you talking so much about money? Why are you talking so much about sharing the gospel? Why are you talking so much about discipleship and serving? And, and that's what you're doing. It's because, guys, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about your heart. 
If your heart is right with Christ, then no excuse you will ever make. Like, we're going to get through our education. We're going to get our house paid off. We're going to... No, 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 no. My heart will be filled with him, and I'll let him sort out the details as I work hard, but he gets my first fruits. If my heart is right, I cannot help but talk about the one that I love to the people that I love or the people that Christ has called me to love. If my heart is right, then no excuse for missing my personal Bible study and prayer life will ever suffice. And if my heart is right, I will never ever just sat, sit back and be a consumer. I will have to be a contributor. I have to take up my cross and follow him. And you see, the reason why is that if our heart is right, right. I believe Beulah, come on, come on and hear me with this. I believe that Beulah can be this church where, where we can get it right, where we are tithers, where we are gospel sharers, where we are discipleship oriented and where we serve, baby. We don't just volunteer, we serve. In other words, until I draw my last breath, I serve. I believe, I've been laughed at, I've even been laughed at by people that are in our community and people that are in our church. But I believe Beulah is on the precipice of growing into that kind of church right there. Woo, come on, I'm speaking it in faith. But to get to be that, la that church, we've got to answer the last portion of this text in verse 17. Paul is going to address a very specific person with a very specific command. And I think this command isn't just for this guy. I think it's for guys and girls like you and like me. Listen to what he says. The Bible reads in verse 17, tell Archippus. See to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. He calls out to Archippus, the last dude he mentions, and he lays it on him. He says, see to it that you fulfill the ministry that you receive from the Lord. See to it that you fulfill what God called you to do. See to it that you take responsibility for everything that God has laid in your lap. See to it. In other words, be convinced of it. Don't push it to the side. This isn't some scrapbook project that you could work on when you're free and when you're not. He's not just trying to remodel a motorcycle or a car or a kitchen. He's saying as of your first importance, God gave you something to do and you have to fulfill it. You have to fulfill it. Now, we know that Archippus possibly could have been uh, 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 the son of Philemon. He's mentioned in Philemon. The Bible says that he is a fellow soldier, so we don't know if he is a soldier in the, in the Praetorian Guard or if he's a soldier in Christ, but somehow or another, he's a convert. God has called him, but between him doing what God called him to do and, and, and the, the call and him actually doing it, there's a delay. And it is such an important calling that it comes into the mind, the nostril, the mouth, the mind, the heart of Paul, and Paul says, the last thing I want y'all to make sure is that everybody here tells Archippus that you have something you're supposed to do and when you delay on it, it's not just affecting you, bro. For this to be the last thing that is mentioned in the book of Colossians, it means that his delay in not fulfilling this is not only going to, it's not only just going to stop or impede work, it's going to be destructive. It's going to be destructive. You see, I don't know exactly what it is, but whatever it is, you can be sure that when God calls someone to that kind of ministry, it is to help people see Jesus. And when you begin to think about this, you got to ask the question, why is it so imp important to fulfill anything that God has given you to do? I think it's important for a couple of reasons that we're going to list out. Number one, friends, I believe it's important because looking back will never ensure straight growth lines. We talked about growth early in the book of Colossians. And I want you to pick up on this now. A saving faith is a persistent faith, regardless of what God calls you to do. And if you're stuck looking back, you can never look forward. And how you go forward will be very, very crooked and will be difficult to follow. Jesus 
put it like this. He said in Luke chapter 9, verse 26, he said that when you put your hand to the plow, you're not to look back. No. When you put your hand to the plow, in other words, you're about an active work. And notice, you put your hand to the plow to what? To till up ground so growth can happen. And Jesus says, anyone who puts their hand to the plow to be my disciple but looks back is not fit for the kingdom. Looking back never, ever, ever ensures straight lines of growth. It's always a hindrance. Think about it. You don't even have to get spiritual about it. You ever had kids in the back seat of the car and they're messing around and you take your eye off the off the road for a second and you and now all of a sudden you hear the the, the rumble strips, you know, it's like, oh, it just messes it up. Why? It's a prelude to a big destruction. It's a prelude to a big destruction. Secondly, finishing what you start is important because unfinished service uh, service is festered by careless saints. When you and I, guys, grow so accustomed to this world that we get careless with what Christ has called us to do, uh, to be and to do, then, then unfinished service happens. That's the reason why largely in the church, 20% do 80% of the work. Only 20% are willing to be contributors. 80% are willing to be consumers. That is not a biblical principle at all. If Christ is your Lord, He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. No excuse can work. You see, where you and I are careless, it will fester an unfulfilled service. Thirdly, it's important for us to finish what Christ calls us to start is because Christ brings completeness. One of the, one of the very basic ways you can see the power and the glory of God is when you're diligent enough to finish what God called you to do, regardless of circumstances, emotions, or cultural trends, regardless of what you're going through, how you feel, or what anybody's got to say about you. God finishes everything he did. He, cre he spoke the world into existence in six days and rested on the seventh. Come on. From It's the mystery of the cross, uh, the mystery of Christ. You remember that? I mean, that's what Paul said. It is the appointed time that Christ, God, who is spirit, took flesh from a woman and lived in that flesh. He didn't leave us on that hill in Jerusalem to have to sacrifice for priests, sacrifice them for themselves, and then sacrificing lambs. No, he came to give the one and only Son of God, the blameless Lamb of God, who would take away the sins of the world. And on the cross, his very last words were, you know them, it is finished. And the hope that when you give your life to Christ is this, and it's what Paul says in Philippians 1.6, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Completion. So here's the point. You can't push pause on Jesus if you really know Christ. Now, if it's just Jesus and you, then you're pressing pause all day. Well, I just want to do this for a little while. I'll get back to it. Well, Pastor Brian, can I just be a sophomore in high school this year? Can I just be a senior this year? Can I just go to college, Pastor Brian? And then when I come back, I'll get right with Jesus. Many a student have said that. And a many a student left Paul's on to the destruction of their soul, their family, and everything. You see, it's not Jesus and you. It's Jesus in you. It's Jesus in you. And he is working in and through you to accomplish his will. And that will is to bring you to completeness. And as you are walking day in and day out, he is showing people what he can do with a broken vessel. That's the reason why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, we have this treasure in broken vessels and jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is not from us, but it is from God. It is from God. Don't you get careless. God brings everything into completion. And then finally, by God, your calling is a call to fulfill, to do what he called you to do. Your calling is a call for you to fulfill. In other words, if you don't fulfill it, then it will be left unfulfilled. By God, he's given you a calling for you to fulfill, for you. So if you have the attitude, well, Pastor Brian, I, I've done my part. Uh, it's time for somebody else. Mm -mm. Do you still have breath in your body? And you still have a place to serve. Oh, Pastor Brian, I would serve, but 
you know, uh, we just don't do things the way we used to do, and I just don't feel like I should be a part of that anymore. Really? Really? Um, did God stop working even when they quit carrying the Ten Commandments around? Did God stop working even when the temple was torn down? Did God stop working even when Jesus died on the cross? Did God stop working even when Jesus was ascended? Many of the disciples could have said, Jesus isn't here walking among us anymore. We're going back. As a matter of fact, they did. <laughs> Peter said, I don't know about y'all, but I'm going back to fishing. I've had three and a half years of this craziness. I'm going back. And about the time he tried to go back to old habits, what did Jesus do? Shows up and says, nah, uh feed my sheep if you really love me. In other words, there is no excuse for why you and I should not fulfill what God has called you to do. What have you been called to do, but you are delaying and being disobedient and fulfilling it? It's hurting the church. It's the reason why culture is so screwed up. Friends, you and I are called to be watchmen, and he put a calling on your life. And if you don't fulfill what he's called you to fulfill alongside of other brothers and sisters in Christ to fulfill that, there will be a vacancy, and you will answer for it. You'll answer for it one day. I've got plenty to answer for. I don't want to answer for that. God's called us at this point to step forward in this sanctuary remodel project. We got to fulfill it in an excellent project under budget with, with blessing and unity for, for us and our ultimately for our community, the people we haven't even met yet. He's called you to completeness. Now, I know you normally overlook the names, but there's a lot to learn in these names. That's the reason why I think Paul writes in Philippians 1 3, Colossians 1 6, all these. I thank my God upon every time I remember you. There's, there's a lot to be learned in the people that walked with Jesus and walked with Paul. How are you walking? You know how I like to do it, guys. I, I want to ask us questions to reflect so that we can live out in obedience. Not just apply this, we can live in obedience. The first question I want to ask us is simply this. What group are you growing in? What group are you growing in? Are you growing with syncretist? Are you, um, are you so comfortable with culture that you just have a few little Christian principles that you hold your life together so that you can feel warm and fuzzy, but it's causing you to be very, very careless with your walk with Jesus to where Jesus really is just one among many options for you? If that's the case, you may not be born again. You cannot have the spirit of Jesus Christ living in your life and feel at home and comfortable in this world. Secondly, do you identify, or, or let me ask you this question, are, are you a part of, is your group that you're growing in as neg negative people? You know, uh, these guys, Epaphras and Tychicus, these guys, uh, they, and Nympha, the, uh, these guys and girls, they were encouragers. They blessed. They had the worst possible scenarios. They didn't have a budget for this. They didn't have anything for that. But they trusted God and they sought to encourage. Are you an encourager? Or are you a gospelist? Do you, are you living missionally like an Epaphras, like a Tychicus, like a, uh, a, 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 a Mark, a Aristarchus, a Jesus called Justice, a, um, a, a man or a woman that, like, like Luke, who no matter where you put them, ministry is going to happen. No matter where you live, people are going to know about Jesus. No matter where you are, you're going to be a giver. You're going to be, you're going to be a disciple. You are going to unequivocally, unashamedly follow Christ because it's not Christ and you, it's Christ in you. Come on. Secondly, do you have an identity or can you identify with any of the above listed names? Can you identify with them? You say, oh man, yes. Or are you encouraged by them to say, I want these qualities in my life. That's why you can't skip over these names. That's why. Thirdly, how are you contributing to help Beulah, or maybe you're part of another ministry to help your church. How are you contributing to that? God is calling you to be exactly who, who you're to be in there. Think about this. How are you contributing uh, to the church as a whole, to Beulah or to whatever church you're in, that that, that church is to be exactly who God wants them to be? And you take part in that. 
So that means that it can't be all about you, but it's about God in you. It's about Christ in you and you serving there and honoring God. And lastly, I want to ask you the question. Is there something in your life left unfinished? Is there something in your life left unfinished? You put it off. You've delayed it. You have not gone through with it. You see, friends, there are many excuses, but none of them will work when you stand before God. And if you got real honest right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, they won't work now either. No excuse is sufficient for why you won't follow Christ. So why don't you follow him today and let him bring into completeness what he has called you to do in the place where he's called you to do it in and to honor God there. Is it going to be easy? No. Will it be blessed? You better believe it. It's not an issue of how you start. It really is an issue of how you finish. Would you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask for your blessed hand and your encouragement to be upon everyone today as we finish Colossians. Father, if there's a man or woman, boy or girl, who's never given themselves to you, today they would say, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. I want you to forgive me of my sins. I want you to come into my life. I want you to save me. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. I will follow you as a Christian. If that's you today, I want you to reach out to us on BeulahChurch.com and say, hey, I just gave my life to Christ. What next? Secondly, maybe you're here and you say, Brian, I really have unfinished work in my life. God has called me to do so many things, but I have, I have put it off to pursue everything else. Don't do that anymore. Maybe today is a day of response for you to where you would say, Jesus, take control of me. I surrender my life to complete what you have called me to complete in Jesus name. Father, would you have your hand upon us? Would you bless? Would you encourage us? Would you walk with us that we may be strong in you? And it's in Jesus name that we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Leave nothing unfinished that Christ calls you to finish. He will work through you. He will help you finish well. God bless. If you identified with today's message and are encouraged by it, we want to hear from you. Our email address is worship at beulahsvl.com. For all our resources, visit us at beulahchurch.com. You may also contribute to this ministry on our website under the Give tab. Please join us again next week. May the Lord bless you greatly.